Hello and welcome to today's live Kendo UI release webcast. We're really excited that you've taken time out of your day to join us for the next hour to look at what's new in Kendo UI. We've got some really fun and exciting updates and demos to share with you. If you're not already following Kendo UI on Twitter, we'd love to have you follow us there to keep up with all the new things happening in Kendo UI throughout the year. So you can find us on Twitter at Kendo UI and never miss a minute of what we're doing. Also, since this is a live webcast with thousands of people watching uh, at the same time, sometimes things go wrong with all the bandwidth. Uh, if you have trouble, use that Q&A log. We'll do our best to help you during the live event. If something goes wrong on your end, don't worry. We're, recover or we're recording everything here. It'll be up on our YouTube channel immediately following the live event so you can catch it all on demand today. We've also got some great raffle prizes that you're eligible for just by being here and part of today's live event. We've got a brand new Surface Pro 3, we've got an iPad Air, a Samsung Galaxy S5, 10 Kendo UI professional licenses which give you all the greatness that Kendo UI has to offer, as well as one new prize. Uh, we're doing something fun today at the end of today's webcast. We'll have a special Q&A prize for the person that asks the most interesting question during the live Q&A. So think about that throughout the event. Plan your great question. Ask it. We'll pick the winner after the event and along with announcing all the other raffle winners, let you know what the question is and who wins in tomorrow's follow-up blog post. So you can watch for that there. Uh, the prize for that of now, uh, obviously, is the AR Drone 2.0, a fun gadgety prize. If you've never checked out these drones, they're a whole lot of fun. In fact, there's even a full API for the AR Drone, projects.ardrone.org, uh, if you're interested in programming against it. If you want to know if you've won one of these raffle prizes, or if you also just want to keep up with what Telerik is doing, we'd also love to have you follow Telerik at Telerik on Twitter. Great way to see if you've won one of these raffle prizes. Uh, again, we'll also blog about it so you can find who's won there, too. If I've not met you before, either at an event or another webcast, my name is Todd England, and I'm EVP for Product Strategy at Telerik. And once again, I, I thank you for joining us today. If you want to keep up with me online, or if you have any questions about Ken UI or anything happening at Telerik, you can find me on Twitter at Todd England. And if this is your first Kendo UI webcast, or if you're new to Kendo UI, thanks for choosing it. We hope you have a lot of fun working with it. Uh, Kendo UI, quite simply, is everything you need to build sites and mobile apps with HTML and JavaScript. We aim to create the most comprehensive library that can solve all those problems you have when you need to build professional applications using web technologies. And we've been doing this now for a few years, and it just keeps getting better and better. In fact, this is the second of three major releases for Kendo UI in 2014. We shipped our last major release in the, uh, in the spring. This is now a spring in the U.S., in North America. I know seasons vary around the globe. So around April, March, April, now we've got our second major release, and we'll have one more major release this year uh, towards the end of the year. With this second major release, we're focusing a lot of attention on how do we make enterprise developers even more productive, address the even more complex scenarios that enterprise developers often face. We've got some enhancements that do that, which we'll look at in just a minute. Before then, just a few updates about Kendo UI around the world. We were recently at Google I.O. showing off uh, our new Angular JS support that's now official with Kendo UI. We had some Telework Ninjas on the ground. Uh, we had some Kendo UI trucks driving around. A lot of fun there talking to developers. And we've also been doing a lot with the thing we introduced in our last keynote as well called Telerik Platform. If you're not familiar with the Telerik Platform, quite simply again, it's the fastest way to turn your web skills into mobile apps. So if you're a developer, which I assume most of you today here are, that no HTML, no JavaScript, the Telerik Platform helps you go all the way from that idea, designing your app, building and testing it, connecting it to data, and eventually deploying it to all of your iOS, Android, Windows Phone devices, managing those deployments, and then eventually even measuring, collecting the information back for how your app's being used so you can make the next version even better. We make this all very simple, seamlessly integrate these pieces, seamlessly integrate with other parts of your workflow you may already to be using, like your favorite IDE, and you can access all of this at platform.telerk.com. In fact, we just launched a brand new web page for the platform that I think a lot of you will love to check out. It explains it's all very fun in a very simple way, so uh, head over to telerk.com to see that, and then you can get your hands on the product, build a neat app using Kendo UI Mobile, using the Telerk platform, once again at platform.telerk.com. And one last update before we move on to the Kendo UI news for today. Uh, we also have recently launched a verified plugins marketplace. If you're doing hybrid development, you know one of the key things you need to be successful is great 
plugins that give you access to those native device capabilities. And while there are a lot of plugins out there for Apache Cordova, for PhoneGap, uh, we realized one of the big challenges was consistently finding plugins that did what they said they do uh, and worked as advertised. And we wanted to solve that problem. So we've done a lot of work improving the plugins, improving the documentation, and bringing them all together in one place, which we're calling the Verified Plugins Marketplace. So you have a, a single source for high quality plugins anytime you're doing hybrid application development. And this works for everybody. You don't have to be using the Telerik platform. Anybody doing Apache Cordova phone gap development, you can come check out, use this resource, plugins.telerik.com. But of course, what we really want to share with you today is how we've improved Kendo UI to address not only uh, complex enterprise developer scenarios, but also just what we've done in Kendo UI Core, the open source version of Kendo UI, and how we're continuing to make that even better. So to be your primary MC to navigate you through what's new, let me invite to the webcast stage Burke Holland, Director of Developer Relations at Telerik, to lead you through the announcements and the news of what's new in Kendo UI. So Burke, the webcast stage is yours. Thank you, Todd. You know, sometimes it feels like all the tech buzz happens in the consumer sector. I mean, mobile apps abound in nearly unquantifiable numbers, and some apps, which admittedly don't do much of anything at all, are getting millions of dollars in venture capital. It's undeniable that what happens in the consumer sector has a huge impact on the private one. Those consumer applications have jumped off our devices and into the enterprise. So, sorry, wrong enterprise. There we go. The business. Businesses of all sizes, from five employees to 50,000, are looking to create brilliant new applications which mimic the features from consumer-facing ones from the Silicon Valley app Darlings. They also want to take advantage of existing apps and bring them into the modern age, an age which offers much more interactivity and interoperability. The enterprise is unique, though. While startups get to build on a blank canvas, enterprises need solutions that can be standardized on and that will stand the test of time. The truth is that the enterprise is often pushing what the web is even capable of. Millions of rows of data hide critical business knowledge and strategic advantages. Enterprise developers are tasked daily with bringing all of this data together for businesses in new and different ways to provide clarity within the noise. And it's not good enough for those solutions to only work on the desktop. Business owners are demanding access to their data anywhere and on any device. That's why we have spent the last quarter doubling down on our features for enterprise developers, culminating in a release that brings enterprise UI for every device. The release includes new features and enhancements in virtually every area of Kendo UI. Now, last quarter, we announced the release of Kendo UI Core, a completely open source and free version of Kendo UI that contains not only the entire Kendo UI application stack, but most of the web widgets and all of Kendo UI mobile. Now, this was not a maneuver to put Kindle UI out to pasture, but an opportunity for us to finally make a world-class UI library available to everyone at no cost. While Kindle UI Core currently offers over 40 widgets, we've added two new ones in this release alone. Developer advocate TJ Vantal will talk about these shortly and cover everything that's new in the world of Kindle UI Core. Kindle UI's comprehensive suite of database controls has been aggressively growing over the past two years, and we've spent a lot of time in this area, ensuring that charts work across browsers and devices and take advantage of any and all available features while leaving no browser left behind. Last quarter, we released the beta of the powerful Kindle UI diagramming tool. This quarter, we're thrilled to announce that it has officially been released to manufacturing. The experience of building this super complex diagramming and, and even a drawing API built the foundation for more incredibly interactive planning widgets that you usually only find in desktop caliber applications. But Kindo UI is bringing them to a browser near you. And John Bristow is gonna be talking more about what is new in that area, so I'm not gonna steal his thunder. Of course, the backbone of many enterprise applications is the Kindo UI grid. It's the most feature-rich control that we have, and we're introducing some exciting enhancements for all you grid fans out there, as well as a completely new kind of grid. Now, before I dive into what's new in Kindle UI Professional, we want to make a pretty big announcement for enterprise developers everywhere. And that is that we have officially graduated our Angular Kindle UI Labs project. That means that we are now shipping Angular JS integration in both Kindle UI Core and Kindle UI Professional as part of the official Kindle UI framework. Angular support for Kindle UI is now included in all Kindle UI support agreements. 
We know how important Angular has become to the enterprise and a fantastic JavaScript framework deserves a gorgeous UI. And that's why we've been working so hard to make sure that our integrations with Angular are top notch. Now the Angular Kindle UI project will always remain open source. We will continue to host separate and more in-depth demos on that lab site, but we're also now including Angular demos with every single widget as part of the official Kindle UI demos. Remember that you can edit any and all of our demos interactively just by clicking the edit this demo button. This is really exciting stuff for Angular developers. Now that being said, let's jump right in and see what's new with the Kindle UI grids and the completely new grid type that we think you're gonna be really excited about. I've got a new project here and we've got a new grid type for you and it's the Kindle UI pivot grid beta version this quarter. Now the pivot grid allows you to connect to OLAP data sources or otherwise known as cubes. To get started, we need first to add a configurator. Now the configurator shows what fields are available to use inside of the cube. So we go ahead and open up a function here. Now inside of this, I first want to create a data source. The pivot grid data source connects specifically to XML a type data sources. This is a specific type of connection that your cube or your data warehouse can expose. Once you expose that, the Kindle UI grid can consume it and then you can work with your OLAP data on the front end. Once we have the data source created, we're going to go ahead and create a new configurator by selecting that configurator div with jQuery and calling Kindle pivot configurator on that element while specifying the data source for the XMLA type data source. Now, once we've done this, we can hop back over to our page refresh, and this is the configurator. We have all of the list of fields coming from the cube on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, these are drop zones where we can drop facts and dimensions and measures to slice and dice data in the cube. But we still don't have the grid yet, so let's go ahead and go back to the code and add in the pivot grid so that we can drag some of these measures out and begin to analyze this data in a business intelligence type fashion. So what I'm going to do is first expand the width of this. I, let's make this 500 pixels for the configurator. That makes it a little bit wider here so that we can see more of the real estate. And then we're going to go into the code and actually add in a div, which is going to become our grid. So let me go ahead and add a grid here. There we go. And we just need to go down into the JavaScript code and transform this grid into a Kindle UI pivot grid. And again, we'll specify the data source. Now that's all the configuration that we actually have to do here. If we go back and refresh, you'll see that there's now a grid below. Now nothing's showing and one's on top of the other. This is actually a really good use case for a Kindle UI splitter. So we can see these things side by side and then resize the left pane when necessary. So I'm just going to wrap this in some splitter markup and then I'll come down and create a new splitter here. There we go. And I'll just specify that the orientation is vertical. So we have left and right panes or excuse me, horizontal. So we have left and right panes. So now we have the grid next to the configurator. Now the next thing that we can do is pick some sort of measure that we want to analyze. If we scroll through here, we've got several. I'm just going to pick the customer count and drag that over to the data fields. And you can see that we have a total of 18,484 customers. And we can find out more about our customers by going to the customer dimension here. Now, I wanna look at these customers and I wanna know what percentage, let's look at these customers by country first. And then let's also look at them. Um, if we spread them out, you can see all the different countries here, customers by country. And then I wanna pull in marital status as well, cause I wanna know um, what the marital status is for our customers in which country. And then, Beyond that, I want to know um, for their marital status, what their home ownership status is after that. So here we can see all customers from the different countries. If we expand, we can see their marital status. And if we expand again, we can see uh, whether or not they're married and then whether or not they're a homeowner as well. So at this point, we're really analyzing our customer base here. This is business intelligence. This is the pivot grid and it works just like a pivot table does in Excel. It's extremely powerful and it's a great way to analyze data to figure out what's actually happening in the business. Now, one of the things we've done here is made some perf improvements. We've used something called a virtual DOM, something made famous by React and, and Mithril and a couple of other libraries. And this is to keep the grid nice and fast for you as you're scrolling through it. Uh, so that the DOM can stay heavy, but the grid stays lightweight and fast because we want these grids to behave just like they're on a desktop. 
Um, and we've done that here in the pivot grid. This is an exciting control. We're very excited about it. Um, excited to see what you're able to do with it um, and be able to provide this sort of level of business intelligence now to your users right through their browser. The next feature that I wanna talk about is what's new in the Kindo UI grid. We've got some new features in the Kindo UI grid. So first let's create a grid and then let's come down and create a, a data source. Now I'm gonna be using the uh, NuGet data source, which is really, really nice because the NuGet data source speaks OData. Now OData is not something Teller invented, it is a, a standard uh, and if you're if your backend services conform to the OData standard, then without having to do any server-side programming, the client-side developer can just specify OData and uh, can start working with that data remotely while having the server still do the processing. Let me show you what I mean. If we refresh this, you'll see all the fields coming back from NuGet. This is a lot of data. Let's uh, trim this down some by adding in a columns uh, specification here for the grid. Here we go, a couple columns here, uh, some width, a uh, little bit of template, nothing out of the ordinary. Now, what we're doing here is looking at all of the packages in NuGet. And NuGet, the feed by default limits us, so we need to make this pageable. So we'll say it's pageable, we'll make it sortable, we'll make it filterable. And then because we're using OData, we can go ahead and say that all of these things should happen on the server side. So I'm gonna come down into the data source and just specify that we're gonna do server paging, server sorting, server filtering, and our page size is 10. Now, once we've done this, we can refresh and here's our grid. And you'll see down here at the bottom, we've got a quarter of a million items actually that we're working with here. And you can see that it's really pretty fast as you move through. We can sort, we can filter. Now, one of the things that we've added is a lot of people said we like this filter menu, but we would really like to see it right underneath the column headers so that we don't have to hit a drop down. Um, and this is an exciting feature we've added. We call it row filtering, or it's sort of a Google style autocomplete filtering. To turn this on, we're basically gonna specify a filter here so we don't have to move through so many packages. I'm just gonna look at the latest version ones. And then we need to uh, change our filterable object here. So I'm gonna scroll up and instead of true, we're gonna set this mode on the filterable object to row. And when we do that, we'll automatically get these now autocomplete boxes under the column headers just like that. So we can go in and look for, say, a specific author. So let's say James Newton, James Newton King, there he is. Uh, oops, I didn't get it. Let me go back and get the uh, autocomplete again. Uh, and you can see that this query is happening on the server. Uh, we get back James Newton King's packages. He's got a very popular one there. Awesome. And of course, we can always sort here, and then we'll clear this filter out. Now you'll also notice on the right hand side we get a numeric text box because downloads is a number and the grid's smart enough to know that. However, if we put in 10,000, we get back no packages and that's because if we hit this toggle here, you'll see that the filter is set is equal to. We can actually specify here that we probably want is greater than here so we can specify that as a default value on the specific column. So we'll come here for that column and again, we'll specify a filterable uh, attribute property, and we'll set the, the uh, operator for the cell equal to greater than. Let me go ahead and format this last curly brace. And now when we go back, I can type in 10,000, and when I tab out, we will automatically get packages filtered that are 10,000 or more. And if we sort them here, uh, this is actually the most popular package is jQuery. No big surprises there. So that is grid autocomplete or grid row filtering. It was a highly requested feature. We're excited to be able to add this. Now, the last thing I wanna show you is the seamless Angular integration that we now have inside of Kindle UI. You can see we're now shipping Angular inside of the Kindle UI download. So up here, we're just gonna add an ng app here and specify that as app. And then we'll go ahead and add a controller on the body. There we go. Just set that to home controller. And because we're now shipping this as part of Kindle UI, it's in kindo.all.min.js, so all you have to do is add in Angular. Seriously, that's it. Everything else is already there. You can start using it. So let's come down and create an Angular app here. There we go. And we're passing in the Kindo directives there with our app. We've got a controller. And to show you how easy it is to port your code, I'm just gonna pull all of this out of here, all this configuration code. There's a lot of it. Uh, I'm gonna cut it out. Let's get rid of this grid definition. Now we can go up to the controller and on the scope object, we're just going to add in all of these options here and put them actually on the scope. So let me just add this in here uh, and we'll call it grid. Uh, I'll tell you what, let me uh, let me fix this, this columns here. I'm gonna need to move this down into the configuration object. Uh, we'll call it grid options and then move the columns down here. 
And now we can go up to the HTML and just put in kindo-grid, which is the directive, the Angular directive for kindo UI, and specify the options with k.options directly off of the scope. And you'll see that everything just keeps right on working. It's that easy to work with kindo UI and Angular. Now, Angular is very declarative, so we could take some of these things out of the scope here and move them into the actual directive itself. So if we come back and you can see these things are now gone, we can go up to the HTML and begin to add these things into the HTML here. So we can specify uh, K pageable is true. We can say K sortable is true. And then we can actually copy in that filterable definition here and everything just keeps right on working. You'll notice that the syntax is very, very similar to the syntax as when you're just working with straight Kindle UI and that's on purpose. I'm gonna refresh and bring it back and you'll see all the functionality is back. So deep, deep Angular integration with Kindo UI. That's the Kindo UI pivot grid, the new grid row autocomplete filtering feature for the Kindo UI grid, and the seamless integration for Angular and Kindo UI. Uh, with that, I'm out of time. I'm going to turn it over to TJ Vantal, developer advocate, to talk to you about what's new in Kindo UI core. TJ? Thanks, Burke, and thanks to everybody out there that joined us today. As Brooke said, my name is TJ Van Toll, and I work as a developer advocate for Telerik. And I'm going to be talking to you about the new and exciting features that we've included in the Q2 release of Kendo UI Core, which includes a few new widgets, as well as some new features for some of our existing components. Now, I want to show you these features in some actual examples, so I'm going to switch over to my browser. Now, as Brooke mentioned, the theme of this webinar is enterprise UIs for every device, and for my own personal experience, one thing that I know every company has is a lot of content, or just a whole lot of text to manage. And let's suppose you work at such a company, and you have this document or text viewing app, and you're tasked with adding some functionality to this, and things like highlighting passages or sharing these documents with coworkers. And of course, there's a lot of different ways you could write that sort of thing, but I want to show you how the new Kendo UI widgets give you some really easy ways of adding such functionality. And we'll start with the toolbar widget. If I switch over to my code, you'll see that all I currently have is this very basic document. I'm including Kendo UI, and then there's just this big wall of text. But I do have this element here, this div, that I want to change into a toolbar widget. So I'm going to head down to my JavaScript here, and I'll paste this code in. So I'm just selecting that toolbar div and initializing a toolbar widget on it. The core of the toolbar API is this items option, which is basically just an array of things that you want to appear in the toolbar. So right now I'm just passing a very simple button. So if I go back to the browser and refresh, see that I now have a toolbar on the top of the screen with a single button within it. Of course, a hello world button isn't all that interesting. So let's head back to the code here and paste in something a little more practical. What I like about the toolbar widget is the API is really intuitive and easy to use. So here I'm just adding a label and then a button group with a larger and smaller buttons that I'm using to control the text size of the actual document itself. And if I switch back over to the browser, you can see how this displays, and I can use these controls to change the size of the text. Let's look at one more. Switch back to the code, and this time I'll add a split button, which has this menu buttons API where I can pass an array of things that should appear in what's gonna look like a dropdown. And if I refresh to show how this looks, you can see that I pretty easily have this dropdown that allows users to change fonts to something that they're more comfortable viewing this content in. As I said, the items API is actually very intuitive. For instance, let's say I want a little space between these two controls. They're kind of close together at the moment. I can just head between them and add a type of separator, head back to my browser. Whoops. Need a comma there. But and now I have this little dividing line between these two, and it was just as easy as adding that. And I could even use CSS. This little divider has a class name of k-separator. I could use some CSS to add some margin to bump these further apart if I wanted to, but I'm, I'm pretty happy with how this looks at the moment. Now, in a real production app, chances are you're going to have a lot more stuff than just this. Um, I know the enterprise apps I've worked on tend to be stuffed full of functionality. Uh, whether they should be or not is another story. But I want to show how the toolbar handles this because I think it's the widget's coolest feature. I'm going to head back to the code and just paste in a whole bunch of buttons here at the bottom. Don't do anything in particular. 
But if I head back to the browser, you can see what the widget did for us automatically. The buttons that didn't fit automatically got moved into this overflow menu. And what's even cooler, if I refresh my browser, watch the buttons, as they don't fit in the toolbar, they automatically get moved into this overflow area. And vice versa when I make my browser larger. Personally, I think this is really cool, especially when you talk about developing applications that have to work on a large number of screen sizes in something like a responsive design. And this gives us some basic functionality for this app. But suppose we now get a request from our users that they want to be able to highlight pieces of the content and to perform some action. And this is something that native platforms have. For instance, I could even take this text, right click on it, and I see the browser's default options, things like copying the text or looking it up in the dictionary. But one thing the browser doesn't let you do is define custom menus that should show up on a right click. And, but that's exactly what the new Kendo UI context menu widget allows you to do. And I want to show how you can add one to this application. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to switch back to my code here, head up to my HTML, and paste in this menu. And this is the menu that Kendo UI will display when a given area of the screen is right-clicked. And we'll see how to configure that in a minute. But the cool thing here is that you can see that this is just some semantic HTML to define a menu. We're providing a few options. I'm adding a way for the user to highlight text as well as a way for the user to share text. So now I'm going to head back down to the JavaScript here and select that element and just initialize a context menu widget on that element. The one option I'm setting is this target option, and that controls which element should listen for right clicks to display the context menu. And if you remember, text is the element that contains all of the text that's being displayed on the screen. So if I go back to my browser here and refresh, now if I right click in this area, you can see that instead of the browser native menu, I'm getting a completely custom menu that's automatically styled based on that markup that we provided. Now, of course, if I click on any of these options yet, nothing happens. And to get some functionality, I'm going to head back to my code and listen for the select event, which will, the widget will trigger every time the user selects a menu option. And all I'm doing is getting the specific item the user picked and just doing a switch over it to handle each one individually. So if the user highlights, I use this little algorithm I found on Stack Overflow to highlight that given portion of text. If the user wants to email this passage, I change the window location. I actually found this little trick. I didn't even know this was possible, but with the mail to protocol, you can actually predefine the subject and body of an email. I didn't know that was possible. Um, I also provide a Twitter option. Your company might not be open to you sharing your internal documents on Twitter, but Twitter does have an API to share segments. You can call slash share and provide a text in the query string, and it'll predefine a tweet. Now, to see what this looks like, I can head back to the browser. And now if I select some text and pick some of these menu options, I can do things like highlight text. I can format, format up an email. It pops up my default mail client with that message pre-filled. And I could also tweet it as well, even though that one was a little bit too long. And the context menu isn't limited to just performing actions on text like I show here. It really could be used anywhere where you think a right click could be useful to the user. Um, you could imagine a table where right clicks give the user the option to delete or edit the entry, for instance. So we built this pretty impressive web app. And the next thing I want to do is take a look at how you might implement this sort of thing as more of a mobile app using Kendo UI Mobile to show what's new in that library. If you're not familiar with Kendo UI Mobile, it's our mobile app development framework that's part of Kendo UI Core, meaning it's also free to use. And you can use it for building mobile websites or for hybrid apps that are built on top of a framework like Cordova or PhoneGap. So what I did was reimagine this UI in the context of a tablet app using Kendo UI Mobile, so I'll switch to that now. What I have here is a Kendo UI Mobile split view that lets you display a UI in two panes. So here I'm using one pane to show the documents, the list of documents that is, and another to show the actual contents of that document. In the actual code, you create this UI by giving a div data role of split view, which is part of Kendo UI Mobile's declarative means of creating widgets and UIs. And then you define two panes within the split view, one here that is being used to show that list of documents, and then another one here that actually 
is used to show the contents of those documents. Now, split views themselves aren't new to Kendi UI Mobile, but we do have one new feature that's small, but it was frequently requested, so I wanted to briefly mention it here. If you provide a footer or header to a split view, it now spans both panes automatically, meaning this footer I provide here with a company name spans across both of these panes in the UI, and I think it looks pretty good. The cooler addition to Kendi UI Mobile is the ability to add the same toolbar that we just saw for our web app. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this toolbar element that I have sitting in my views layout here. I'm going to head into the JavaScript here and use the same Kendo toolbar call to change that element into a toolbar widget. Now, since this is the same widget, I could have just copied and pasted the same code we used before, but I thought I'd use a UI that felt more like a native mobile app. So if I switch back over here and refresh and select a document, you can see that I have this really nice looking UI with just some very minimal configuration. And what's really cool is the same overflow behavior that we saw earlier also works in the context of this mobile app. So if I add a few buttons like before, you can see that Kendo UI Mobile handles this situation elegantly, just like it did in our desktop situation, even as I resize the screen. And if I switch over to my actual device here, and I'll go ahead and refresh, you can see that this looks great. And it even elegantly handles the orientation change here. And this behavior is great, if not essential, if you consider the vast array of screen sizes that people have on mobile devices and tablets, especially when you bring Android into the picture. Now, the very last thing I want to discuss for this Kendo UI core release is a new semantic zoom effect. Now, if you're a Windows 8 user, particularly a Windows 8 tablet user, you've probably seen this effect before. And I would bring up a custom demo of this, but the Kendo UI team has already created a pretty darn good one out on our demo site, which I'll switch to now. What this demo does is it shows you all the albums out from a given artist, and if you click on one, it uses that semantic zoom effect to give that nice zoom in effect and actually show the album details and what songs are actually in the album. The effect uses CSS3 animations and transitions, so you can see that it performs great. Now, I wanted to show this on the demo site because there's a cool feature that we've added relatively recently to all of our demos and even our API documentation, and that's the ability to edit, edit any of these examples you see in our dojo, which I can get to by clicking this button here. The dojo is a great way to tinker with Kendo UI because you can instantly see the results of your changes as well as save your changes in a bookmarkable URL or by just downloading the file that you see here. Now in this case, I was curious how the Kendo UI team built this. And I was actually surprised to find out that somewhere down here, there it is, they're using a Kendo UI data source and actually hitting an iTunes JSON API. Now, I was surprised by this because I didn't realize that iTunes actually had a JSON API, but I did want to tinker with this. So I don't share the same love of Italian pop music that the Kendo UI team does, so I thought I'd start by just changing the artist ID here to something I could appreciate a bit more. And as you can see, you see the effect of that change automatically. The semantic zoom effect itself, you can see in use here, is just a simple configuration variable that tells Kendo UI how to transition between two different views. If you want to learn more about how this effect works, I'd encourage you to try out the effect in the dojo yourself. Um, this particular demo can be found at demos.telerik.com slash UI. And you don't need to remember this entire URL because you can always search. And I'd really encourage you to play with all our demos as we've spent a lot of time polishing up the demo site and adding a whole lot of functionality. So you can see there's a lot of stuff to play with, including some entire sample applications showing how a lot of this stuff comes together. And as a final reminder, everything I showed you today is part of the open source Kendo UI core distribution. So you can view the code or submit issues and pull requests at github.com slash Telerik slash Kendo UI core. Now, that's all I have for you today. So I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, John Bristow, who's going to be showing off what's new in Kendo UI Professional. John. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name's John. We're going to spend the next few minutes taking a look at what's new in Ken UI Professional. 
This release should be really exciting for developers looking for enterprise-grade widgets for line of business applications. It includes three of the most voted widgets on our user voice portal and two additional chart types to enrich your data viz arsenal. There's a lot of really great stuff packed into this release. Burke has already spent some time showing you the pivot grid, so I'm going to focus on the other aspects that are new. First up is the diagram widget. This widget was first introduced in the Q1 release as a beta. For RTM, we've added several enhancements. Not only have we extended the API, we've also added support for both MVVM and VML for those folks using older versions of IE. For those of you who haven't seen the diagram widget before, it's a pretty simple control to figure out. However, it's extremely powerful and flexible. In this example here, I've rendered four shapes inside of the diagram. Generating this diagram is a pretty trivial exercise. If we take a look at the underlying markup, you can see here we have a div tag with the ID of diagram. To turn this element into a Kendo UI diagram, in the underlying JavaScript file, we call the API Kendo Diagram. Additionally, we'll also provide a set of configuration properties for things such as the data source, the type of layout we wish to use, and a template for drawing things to the diagram itself. The template is very akin to HTML templates. They are a set of instructions for drawing shapes to the diagram surface. Taking a look at the visual template function, you can see here we have a set of APIs for appending shapes to our surface. Here I've gone ahead and drawn a rectangle. This will serve as the surrounding entity for my Twitter profiles. I've also used a text block here for rendering out the first and last name of each Twitter profile. Underneath the name, I also have the title, or in this case, the Twitter profile handle. And finally, I can include an image which will render inside of that exact location. This visual template is using items that come from a data source. That data source was defined as part of our visual template. Scrolling up, you can see that our data source here is pretty simple. By taking these entities and binding them directly to the visual template, we can then render that out to the diagram you see here. In addition to the drawing primitives I just showed you, the diagram API includes a variety of layout algorithms. So if I don't like the structure that I have here, I can change it automatically simply by changing its layout. The diagram widget is pretty powerful. You can have interaction with mouse and touch. For example, I can go ahead and change the size of these elements. I can also add new connectors between them as well as conduct operations such as rotation. Everything you're seeing here is done through a drawing API. In this release, we're making that API available to you. Here you can see three clocks rendered out as SVG content to the screen. Notice here that I can swap in between the rendered output for SVG and Canvas, and the result is exactly the same. The drawing API gives you a level of indirection so you don't have to worry about the resulting output. Much like the diagram widget you just saw, targeting the drawing API turns out to be a pretty simple exercise. The API itself is pretty extensive. It also includes a number of geometric shapes to help you draw to the surface. Now let's switch gears and talk about the Gantt chart, a new widget in this release. The Gantt chart is a critical widget for many enterprise line of business applications. This release features a Gantt chart that is highly interactive and highly programmable. The Gantt chart in KendoUI features a number of common functions. You can add tasks. You can add child tasks. You can also insert tasks either below or above the highlighted task. In addition, I can also move these tasks around if I so wish. We have the ability to pivot on the view. Here I can see items for the week and for the month. And I can also, if I so wish, through this nice display here, designate how completed a task is. I can move these around, and I can also relate their dependencies. Looking at how this is implemented, you can see here that we have a simple element, which is our div tag and an ID of Gantt. To turn this into a Gantt chart, we need to invoke the Kendo Gantt API. 
This API allows you to define a data source and a set of dependencies for the tasks inside of your Gantt chart. This is a simple example, however, you can have much more complicated ones as well. Here's a Gantt chart with much more realistic data. Let's go ahead and expand our task view. These are tasks for a software project I'm managing. For this project, I want to conduct my market research before validating with customers. The Gantt chart allows me to do that through an easy drag and drop interface. Let's now see how to create this chart in code. We have the same div tag we had before. Looking at our underlying JavaScript, you can see it's a little bit more complicated. To support the Gantt chart in this release of Kendo UI, we have a new data source type called Gantt Data Source. The Gantt Data Source provides APIs for accessing all the tasks related to the Gantt chart itself. I've also gone ahead and defined a schema. This schema is defined for all the tasks within my Gantt chart. Everything from its ID to its start date, end date, title, and percent complete. The Gantt chart will use this data when rendering the content to the screen. The Gantt dependency data source is another new data source type to support the Gantt chart. These dependencies interrelate the tasks present in the Gantt chart itself. You can see here the schema for dependencies is a little simpler. Dependencies allow you to define task predecessors and successors. We can then integrate the tasks and their dependencies into the Kendo Gantt chart by simply specifying them on the data source and the dependencies properties. Now, of course, the Gantt chart can be underpinned by Angular for configuration and initialization. Here's the custom directive for my Gantt chart. Here I'm specifying the options for the Gantt chart using the same tasks and dependencies from the previous example. Another new widget found in Kendo UI Professional is the tree map. This is a data visualization widget that enables you to display hierarchical or tree-like data using nested rectangles. Tree maps are great for making efficient use of space for large data sets. Each rectangle in the tree map structure represents subnodes, and you can easily distinguish parent-child items using this type of graphical representation. The tree map is useful when displaying segmentation of populations, results from political polls or elections, and so on. Here you see the tree map displaying data in a squarified configuration. I can switch it to a vertical configuration for slicing and dicing data, as well as a horizontal configuration. Let's see how this works. I'll simply define a div tag with an ID of tree map. I'll then initialize the tree map using the Kendo tree map API. The data I'm binding to is hierarchical in nature. It contains two fields, value and name. The size of the rectangle in the tree map will be denoted by its value, and the name will be written on that rectangle representing it. Next up is the range bar chart. This is an ideal widget to visualize value ranges over time, compared by single or multiple factors. This chart is also suitable for financial data, showing price movements and volatility over time. In this example, we're showing the average weather conditions for a particular city. Let's see how to create this chart. First, we initialize our element. Next, we initialize the chart using the familiar Kendo chart API. A lot of these options will seem familiar to you if you've used this chart API before. The difference here is we're specifying a type called range column. Additionally, the data is represented in tuples. Everything else is pretty much the same. The waterfall chart is another new chart available in this release of Kendo UI Professional. It's a great chart for illustrating the cumulative effect of successive positive and negative values. Being a web developer, however, I typically think of it more in the horizontal mode. Anyone who's used the developer tools of browser today knows that this mimics the waterfall found in the network developer tools. Let's see how this is constructed. Simple declaration. At the top is my data, consisting of a caption and the elapsed time. I've also defined a palette array for my colors. Inside the create chart function, I'm using the Kendo chart API binding my data to the request data you see above, 
And here, I'm specifying horizontal waterfall as the chart type. Pretty simple. Now I can use this chart type to render out the timings from a HAR file, for example. Last, but certainly not least, is a new bubble layer for the map widget. This layer enables you to display data for comparative regions on a map. In this example, as I hover over certain geographical locations, you can see I can get a not only listing of the region itself, but also its population. Let's see how this works. On this page, I have a simple map declaration. I also have two templates. One template is used for displaying the city, country, and population. The other is for the default. In the underlying JavaScript, I'm using the Kendo Map API to define the map on my page. I'm then using the bubble type for one of its layers. The data for this layer is defined in a variable called urban areas. Urban areas points to a JSON declaration showing you the data for each city in Canada. And that's it. Lots of great stuff in this release of Kendo UI Professional. As the others have said, this release truly does deliver an enterprise UI for every device. Thank you, John and TJ. Those were some amazing demos. Uh, if we moved a little fast for you, don't worry. We're recording this webinar and all the source code will be posted shortly. Now you're gonna to begin to notice more and more of Telerik's products that are gonna be coming together in new and different ways. We've extended our integration between products even more this past quarter with a new feature called Responsive Images. The Responsive Images service is a part of Telerik Backend Services. It's widely known that images are a major source of slowdown in web apps and especially in mobile apps. This new service will resize your images for you so that they are exactly the size that they need to be when they are displayed. Our engineers have been really hard at work on this project for quite a while now to make sure that the service is just as fast as requesting the image normally. If you want to see how this works, you can point your phone browser to cuteness.io. Now, this is our in-house demo Kindle UI mobile app. Then you can point your browser to cuteness.io slash responsive to see the same app with responsive images. We are really, really happy about the combination of Kindle UI mobile and responsive images, and we think that this is really one of the key missing pieces in building highly performant apps. To use responsive images today, make sure you have a Telerik platform account and also check out the documentation in the backend services feature section of the Telerik platform. A few final notes here, a reminder that Kindo UI Core is free and available from our site or from GitHub. You get access to over 40 widgets plus the two new ones we just added and of course Angular support is included in Core as well. Kindo UI Professional includes everything that you've seen here today, along with Telerik's industry-leading support directly from the engineers who build Kindo UI. If you're working with a server-side technology, be sure to check out our ASP.NET MVC, JSP, or PHP wrapper suites for Kindo UI that make integration with Kindo UI and your favorite framework a snap. If you're just using Core and you want support, you can always purchase a premium support package to get some tickets. You can also use premium support to purchase more tickets anytime if you're a professional or a wrapper packages customer. We're offering a special keynote promo today for everyone who attended. Look for this code in our follow-up emails and make sure that you use it since it does have an expiration date. All of our winners will be announced shortly along with a recording of this video and all of the sample code. Keep your eyes peeled for that announcement by following the at Kindo UI Twitter account. So head on over to www.telerik.com slash Kindo UI and download all of the new amazing things. And we're really looking forward to seeing what you build with it. With that, we're going to head over to the live Q&A. Uh, I believe there's going to be a bit of a transition here as we open up the line. If you have to drop off, thanks so much for joining us. Go download Kindo UI and be awesome.